World War II began officially September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. Britain and France declared war two days later on Germany. Canada entered the war about one week later. The United States entered World War II about two years later on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Now, most people are familiar with what happened on that day. The Japanese warplanes left more than 2,400 American servicemen dead. They destroyed or badly damaged 200 planes and 24 ships. More than 1,100 men died when one battleship was destroyed. But things might have been different. Two soldiers were on duty early that morning at a mobile radar unit on the island of Oahu. One of them saw something on the radar that they believed could have been warplanes. So they took this information to their superiors, and they were told, well, they, those, those are probably just American planes that are, are going on practice runs. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Well, it wasn't long, and the blip on their radar screen disappeared because those planes were now very close to land. Two soldiers decided that they would just go and eat breakfast. Eight minutes later, at 7.53 a.m., the first bombs began to fall on Pearl Harbor, and the carnage began. Even though for almost an hour, there was clear, irrefutable evidence of what was about to take place. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been swimming in the ocean, but uh, I come from Alabama. I'm from Alabama here a while back, and I live here in Michigan now, but I came from Alabama, and we live right down there on the Gulf Coast, right there on the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm familiar with beaches. And some of you who are familiar with beaches might know that when you go to some parts of the ocean, they, they can be treacherous because of the undercurrents that, that exist there. The sea might look calm and inviting, but underneath the water there is an undercurrent that can draw you out to sea very quickly if you're not careful. You can't see the danger, but the danger is there. It's like that warning light on the dashboard of your car. You can't see your engine, but that little warning light tells you that something might be wrong and you better get it checked out. If you don't, you could be in trouble because behind the scenes there may be some danger or difficulty lurking. And there are warning lights that are flashing in the book of Revelation. They are letting us know that behind the scenes there is danger. We read in the book of Revelation about an ominous power that is going to come to this world. It's going to bring spiritual darkness to planet Earth. And we also see that in Revelation there is the battle of Armageddon. There's the seven last plagues that are going to fall on this Earth. So what's really going on behind the scenes? You don't want to go just blissfully about minding your own business when there's a squadron of attack planes bearing down on you. In the beginning, God created a perfect world. And in this perfect world, he created a garden, the Garden of Eden. And he placed two perfect people in that perfect garden, in this perfect world. There was no sin. There was no death or disease, no debt or depression or divorce or deception. But sin came and it originated in the most unlikely of places. The Bible says long ago there was war in heaven. And understanding how this could happen can help us come to grips with why there is death and sickness and sadness and sorrow in our world today. It will help us understand some important prophecies in the Bible. Now, while most of us have never been caught in the heat of battle, this war that began in heaven has spread to earth, and it involves all of us, you and me. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9 says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, 
that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, why was there war in heaven? And how does that war in heaven affect us here on planet earth today? And what does an angel have to do to get kicked out of God's house? What happened to Lucifer that caused him to go so bad? The answer is found in God's word. So let's see what the Bible tells us. Isaiah chapter 14 contains these incredible words. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. As incredible as this sounds, this angel declared that he wanted to sit on God's throne. He wanted to sit in God's place. Now, the one that we call Satan, Lucifer, was created by God, not as the devil, but as a beautiful, privileged angel. The Word of God describes him as the covering cherub who dwelt in the very presence of God. He was not only beautiful, but he was perfect and evidently very musical as well. But for reasons that you and I can't entirely understand, the devil wanted to be in God's place. He didn't want to be subordinate. He wanted to be superior. He wanted leadership. He wanted rulership. But what Satan wanted more than anything else was worship. He was dissatisfied with the position that he had been given. He wanted to be somebody or something he was never intended to be. He came to the place that he wanted to receive worship that was due to God alone. Now the reason this is important today is because the book of Revelation says that the key issue that's going to confront human beings down at the end of time is the issue of worship. So let's look at Revelation 13, 1 through 3. It says, Then I stood on the sands of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had, it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Now notice what this next verse says. So they worshipped. Now this is talking about virtually all of the people on this earth. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? At the end of this world's history, the key spiritual issue that will, f that will be focused upon is the issue of worship. Satan wants to receive the worship of this world. He wanted worship in heaven, and when he wasn't able to achieve that, he, s he set his sights on this world. You know, Paul called Satan the power of the prince of the air. Jesus told Peter, Satan has desired to have you. Satan wants this world. Satan claims the kingdom of this world and everything in them as his very own. Worship in heaven didn't happen as he wanted. So he came here to this earth and he tried to gain control of this world. Let me ask you, do you think it looks like Satan has been trying to gain control of this world? Look around you. Does it look like he's had any success? I don't think any, either of us here, any of us here, can say there's any question about it. Which direction is this world heading? If you and I are honest with each other, 
we will say this world is heading down, down, down. What we commonly see in the media today, we would never have seen a generation ago. This world is humanistic, it's secular, it's skeptical, it's full of doubt. And more people today than ever are living without any reference to God. Today you hear people say, instead of being, I'm a committed Christian, they say, oh, I'm a spiritual person. They have no reference to God. All they have reference to is spirituality. Spirituality doesn't necessarily mean God. Is this a coincidence? Or is it what, is what we see a master plan created by a master planner who wants to receive the worship of this world? Is it coincidence that church attendance is down and skepticism is off the charts? Look at the radar screen. You'll see a blip. It's big and it's headed straight for us. And we better know it's there because if we don't act, it will soon be too late. Something is going on behind the scenes. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says that a beast emerges. And this beast is given power by the dragon or Satan. And Satan works through this beast. Now, we're going to identify that beast, but not tonight. In a later presentation, we will identify who this beast is. But Satan works through this beast so he can receive worship of the people of this world. Now, I want you to know, notice a progression here. In heaven, Satan desired worship. But he only succeeded in deceiving one-third of the angels. And he was cast out of heaven to this earth, and then he led Adam and Eve into sin. But that wasn't the last of the devil's temptations. Far from it. Following Jesus' baptism, Jesus went into the wilderness. He went there to fast and to pray and to prepare himself for the ministry that he was about to engage in. He was there about six weeks without any food. It was then that the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, why don't you command these stones be turned into bread and fill your stomach? I know you're hungry. Now this was a real temptation. Jesus had been there for six weeks, no food. This was a real temptation. You and I know how we feel if we miss one meal. And here's the devil saying, look, all of these stones are here. They look like bread. You have the power to turn them into bread, to fill your stomach. Turn them into bread so that you're not hungry anymore. There's two important things here. First of all, Jesus was being tempted to use his miracle working power to benefit himself. That's a selfish reason. Second, Satan was tempting him to doubt his father. You remember at Jesus' baptism, the father said from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God the father called Jesus his son. And yet Satan says, if you are the son of God, he was tempting Jesus to doubt what his father had said. But Jesus' response was an example of, for us today. Jesus answered by saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus appealed to the word of God for his answer. And Jesus was triumphant over this temptation. But the devil wasn't defeated yet. He thought that he could still succeed. So he tried again. He took Jesus to a high place and said, throw yourself down because Psalm 91 says you can cast yourself down and the angels will hold you up so you don't dash your foot against a stone. Jesus again went to the Scriptures and he answered from the Scriptures, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But Satan still was not done. He still thought he could succeed and cause Jesus to fall, cause him to sin. 
So he said to Jesus, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world on one condition, that you bow down and you worship me. Now let me ask you a question. Did Satan own all the kingdoms of this world? He didn't. He doesn't. Who owns all the kingdoms of this world? God does. So when the devil told Jesus... I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. He's promising to give something that he doesn't own. And the devil will do that to you and me today. He will promise you anything, promise to give you anything, even if it's something he doesn't own, to get you to do what he wants you to do. Satan was trying to get Jesus to bow down and worship him. But Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. Satan was finally turned back and was defeated. This shows what motivates the devil. He's after the worship of the world. But you and I can be encouraged by what we just talked about. Because we can defeat the devil the same way that Jesus did. Now, you and I are tempted every day. I know I am. I don't know about you, but I am. We're tempted every single day. And when temptation comes, we can do what Jesus did. We can meet temptation with the Word of God. The weakest, trembling sinner, armed with the promises of God, is in a position far greater, of far greater strength than all the powers of hell combined. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible tells us that God wants to dwell in us. And we also know that the devil claims this world is his own, so greater is he that is in you than the devil who is in this world. The devil tried to get Jesus to worship him. Ezekiel wrote about the devil in Ezekiel chapter 28. He said, you are the anoint, were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I think that's kind of selfish, don't you? Satan was looking at himself and saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a pretty good looking guy. I look just as good as Jesus. I look just as good as God. Why don't people worship me? Satan was filled with self-centeredness. He wanted to elevate his, himself to the position where he would be worshipped. And as a result, sin came to this world. When we live today in a world of crime and violence and misery, tornadoes come and they destroy towns, they rip through trailer parks and leave carnage and death behind. But that, my friends, is not God's doing. That's Satan's doing. A child is born with HIV, or maybe a tsunami sweeps through a village and leaves death behind. People say, well, where was your God then? Couldn't your God have prevented that? God gets blamed for what the devil causes. the former CEO of Apple, Steve Jobs, was 13 years old. And he saw a magazine that, that struck him, and so he took this magazine to church to show to his pastor. On the front cover was a picture of some starving children. 
So he went up and he asked his pastor, he said, Pastor, does God know stuff before it happens? Does he know what's going to happen? Pastor says, yes. Yes, Steve, he knows. Then he held up the magazine and he showed the pastor the picture and he asked him, did God know about this? The pastor said, Steve, I know it's hard to understand, but yes, God knows all about that. Steve said, I don't want to worship a God like that. I don't want to worship a God that would let these things happen. But wait a minute. Is it really God's fault? You know, there's a story in the Bible about a man who had a wheat field. Someone came along and sowed weeds, planted weeds in his field. And somebody asked him, who did this? He said, an enemy has done this. So look around today. The emergency rooms are filling up because an enemy has done this. People are dying prematurely because an enemy has done this. A drunk driver runs the red light. Innocent people die. Was that God's doing? No. The enemy has done this. God is love. God wants to save people. So why doesn't God stop suffering? Why does he allow it? Let's see if we can figure this out. When Lucifer started rebelling against God in heaven, what options did God have? Could God have just simply destroyed Lucifer? Sure, he could have. But what if he had? Imagine an angel in heaven saying, you know, Lucifer said that God is unfair, so God just destroyed him. Now, would the angels of heaven be serving God out of love or out of fear? Someone else says, well, couldn't, couldn't God just go ahead and destroy Lucifer and, and wipe him out and then wipe the, the memory of all the angels so no one would even remember it? Then no one would even know. Sure, God could have done that. But there's somebody who still would have known. God would have known. That's the integrity of God. God wants us to love Him by choice, not out of fear. God loves you enough to tell you, to allow you to know the whole truth and to choose to love Him or not, knowing the whole truth. God gave the angels freedom of choice. He took a risk because there was always the chance that the angels might use that freedom of choice unwisely. That's what Lucifer did. He used that freedom of choice in a selfish way. God took a risk, another risk, and he gave us freedom of choice also. We have the freedom to worship him or not. We have the freedom to obey him or not. And this freedom of choice worked perfectly well in the beginning. Adam and Eve were blissfully happy in their Garden of Eden home until the devil came along. When they were tempted, they exercised their freedom of choice in an irresponsible way. They should, uh, or, or should God have given the human family freedom of choice? In this society, we have freedom of choice, right? We live in a free country. We live in the United States of America. We can go and learn to fly a plane if we want. But the expectation is that we won't fly that plane into a building somewhere. You're free to go and get a driver's license. But the expectation is that you drive responsibly so that you don't harm other people. God gave Adam and Eve freedom of choice. But when they were tempted by the devil, they used that freedom in a very selfish way. Now, Satan lied to them, true enough. He said, God knows when you eat this fruit that you will be like God. God is holding something back from you, he said. So they bought the lie of the devil, and they ate the fruit, and today the battle rages on here on this world. And God gets blamed for the sin that's here. 
Why didn't God stop Adam and Eve from using their freedom of choice the way they wanted to? To remove their freedom of choice would have been to make robots of Adam and Eve. How many of you have children? Do you want a child that is a robot that comes up to you, I love you, Mommy. I love you, Daddy. Is that what you want? Do you want them to love you because that's what they're programmed to do? Or do you want them to love you because they choose to love you? To remove that freedom of choice would have made robots of Adam and Eve. How appropriate would that have been? God did everything possible. He warned Adam and Eve. He warned them of the danger. He did all he could to prepare them for the temptation that he knew was coming. But what about all the suffering that resulted? Remember this. No one suffered more than God because of what sin had done. It cost him the life of his sinless son. God knew that if he created human beings, that they couldn't be happy without the freedom of choice. And although sin came and it damaged this world and it caused suffering and sadness, we are still free to use our power of choice, either to honor and serve God and to receive everlasting life or to go our own way. Matter of fact, sin is a result of squandering that that gift of choice that God has given us. It should show us how important it is to be connected with God. Today we have people with freedom of choice. All of us have freedom of choice. Even people who live in countries who are not free have freedom of choice. There are people today who have that freedom of choice but have not, not surrendered that freedom to God. In God is life. It's like saying if I plug in a lamp and turn the light switch on, I get light, right? It's like being connected to God. But when I choose to pull the plug, the light stops shining, but it's not God's fault. I made the choice to unplug the light. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities or your sins have separated you from God. And God is the source of all life. He is the creator. Now, Satan was smart. He knew that if he could get us to turn away from God, that we would be lost. And we would be in the same situation that he is in. So did God take a risk in giving the human family freedom of choice? Absolutely. God took a huge risk. But who risked the most? God did. Because he knew that if humanity sinned, if they made the wrong choice, he would send his son Jesus to come and pay the penalty for our sin, for my sin, and for your sin. But he did it anyway. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The enemy of souls wants to convince you that God is unfair, that God is unjust. Look around you everywhere today. There's a battle that's raging. There are physical battles. There are mental battles. There are spiritual battles. There are relationship battles. There are financial battles. There are battles everywhere you look. The battle is raging around you, but the most important battle is the battle for your mind. Because in your mind is where you make the choice of who you are going to worship. And the devil knows if he can separate you from God, that this life is the only life you will have. In 1914, there was a British explorer named Ernest Shackleton. He was sailing to Antarctica where he planned to cross the entire continent on foot. He got very close to Antarctica when his ship became stuck in the ice. 
He was stuck there for many months, and finally the ice moving around as it did around his ship finally began to destroy his ship. Shackleton and his men knew they had to evacuate, so they let down the lifeboats, and they got in the lifeboats, and they were able to make it to an island called Elephant Island. They were a long ways from anywhere. Down in the Antarctic where it's freezing cold, you can die in minutes. Shackleton made the decision. He was going to try and sail across some of the roughest, roughest seas on the planet to South Georgia Island to try and get help. He took five men with him and left 22 men behind on the island. He told them he would be back. They were to wait for him and be ready whenever he arrived. The men waited one month. Then they waited two months. Three months went by. I'm sure the thought came into the head, surely he must be dead by now. After all, he sailed across some of the most treacherous seas in existence. But they waited. Deep inside, they knew he would be back. And when Shackleton finally returned, after four and a half months, every single man was rescued. They trusted Shackleton, and they were saved. The Bible says that Jesus will come back to this world. Jesus himself promised that there are mansions, and, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Those who trust Jesus will be saved. My friends, the Bible, God's Word, can be trusted. You saw that in the previous meeting. God, God outlaid the nations of this world for hundreds, thousands of years. If God can do that, God can be trusted. His Word can be trusted. And if His Word can be trusted, He can be trusted. They go together. You can't take them apart. And if we can trust God and His Word, we can trust His promises that the best is yet to come. We can be a part of a kingdom that will never end. We can be a part of a kingdom that can be trusted. You know, in the world we live in today, sometimes it's it's hard for us to trust the leaders because we see the corruption that goes on all around us in government and high up leadership, and it's there. I worked in government, I know. We have a hard time trusting the leadership of my friends. God is not like these earthly leaders. You can trust God. You can trust His Word. You can trust His promises. And Jesus spells out the problem of the masses of people today when He says, but you are not willing to come to Me that you may have life. All you need to do is come to Him. You can come to Him just as you are. He doesn't say, go clean yourself up first and then come to me. He doesn't say, go take off those clothes and put on clean clothes and come to me. Go take a bath and then come to me. Go go and, and stop sinning first and then come to me. Jesus says, come as you are. But sometimes we feel reluctance to come to Jesus. That reluctance to come to Jesus might just cost us eternity. Jesus knocks at the door of your heart tonight. Jesus is waiting for you to let Him in so He can live His life through you. He will keep you connected to Him. He will love you and He will never let you go. Are you ready to allow Jesus into your life tonight? Are you ready to let Him keep you as His own? It won't be long, and Jesus will return. We say Jesus is coming soon. I don't like that. 
Because that's not what Jesus says in the book of Revelation. Read the book of Revelation. Jesus doesn't say, I'm coming soon. Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. And in this world of sin, while the battle rages on around us, we can have the peace of heaven now. We can have that peace and certainty of salvation through Jesus Christ. While the battle is raging around you, while people are dying left and right, while people you love get cancer and die, while your, your spouse divorces you or maybe he or she beats you, maybe they're cheating on you, maybe your child is sick, maybe your child is about to die. If you want peace, there's only one place to find it. And that one place, my friends, is in the Word of God. Because when you know this book, when you, when you dig into this book and you get to know God, you will find the peace that you so desire. And the book of Revelation is a book of hope. It's not a book of, of doom and gloom. It's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And if it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, don't you think there is peace there? Jesus brings peace. I worked as a police officer for over 20 years. I've seen people die before my eyes. Some of them were my fellow police officers. The only way I was able to keep peace in my life was because I know the peacemaker. If you want to know the peacemaker tonight, if you want to have that peace regardless of all the, the wars raging around you, I want you to stand to your feet right now and show Jesus, yes, Lord, I want to have the peace that only you can give. I don't care about the wars, the battles. I want the peace that you can give me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You and we praise You that even though the wars are raging around us, even though the devil is doing everything he can to distract us from You, to keep us from You, I praise You that You are always there. You're waiting for us, asking us, pleading with us to come to You just as we are. I thank You that You are waiting with open arms ready to take us in, to love us, to give us that peace that passes all understanding. We love You, Lord. We're standing here tonight as a witness to You that we want You in our lives. We want to commit our lives totally and completely to You so that we can have that peace and be ready to meet You when You come. We thank You and we praise You in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who died for us.